Welcome, Mark Gemini Thwaite to the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm good, thank yeah, you. Feeling yeah, feeling good? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for coming by. I appreciate it. Uh, I've been a fan of your music for a while, and um, I love what you have going on with your solo music. And you know, a lot of what you've done in the past is, you know, I, I've been following you for a while. So thank you for coming by and telling me about what you have going on. So, so for this year, what are your, your major goals for 2023? Let's get into that. Yeah, well, you know, obviously we're coming out of the pandemic the last couple of years, which kind of um, put to bed any touring plans, you know. Um, 2020, even before the pandemic kicked in, uh, I'd been touring with Peter Murphy, uh, the Bauhaus singer, and because Bauhaus had reformed uh, the year before and played a few shows, 2020 was blocked out to be like the year of Bauhaus and they were going to do a shitload of shows. And uh, that all got put to bed with the pandemic. I, w I was also going to be doing a tour um, on guitar with Lords of Acid, you know, okay. the, the Belgian band. And I was actually in rehearsals uh, for that tour, a US tour in March 2020. And obviously the pandemic, news of the pandemic was looming and we were hearing about shows being cancelled here and shows being cancelled there. But we were still in rehearsals and the band had flown over from Belgium. We were rehearsing. I'd done the whole set. And it was the last day of rehearsals. And then we got told. And the first show was going to be the next day. Oh, wow. Uh, 13th of March, interestingly. But we got told on the 12th of March, yeah, the tour was cancelled. That All the venues were just basically shutting down. You were not allowed to have gatherings of more than... 250 people so that ruled out the whole tour yeah and so we'd rehearse for nothing and i never got to set foot it's weird because i've kind of played with lords of acid in a room but not live on stage so that's kind of weird um but uh, so it kind of forced me to spend the last couple of years to focus on studio work you know so doing a lot of guitar sessions for people and also some mixing work i did some mixing work for cleopatra like Yerky 69, I did some I love mixing. that track, dude. I love that track you did. And that oh, whole record is sick. Like, it's a great record, yeah. Yerky's a friend, and uh, but it wasn't him that asked me. It was the label, like, so would you mix this track? And so I did that, and I mixed... Um, well, I co-wrote some stuff during the pandemic with Big Paul Ferguson, the drummer of Killing Joke. We've been kind of collaborating for a little while. Yeah, you know, Paul's the drummer and, and the vocalist, and he'd come up with these basic sort of grooves and ideas, and I would expand them with guitars and extra synths and stuff like that and then he would get me to mix them nice. so i was kind of learning you know how to mix other people's stuff instead of my own uh, i'd learned to mix my own stuff with the mgt material which we'll talk about in a bit uh my solo stuff but um yeah so i did, ended up putting out a couple of albums with big pool because one of them we'd worked on a few years before but it got re-released properly you know remixed and expanded and um yeah, I mixed uh, like an album by a group called the Prog Collective. Who, Saw that uh, the covers. Yeah, it's all yeah. like covers of uh, various songs, "Sand of Silence" and you know, uh, "Year of the Cat" and all these kind of you know hippie, folky sort of psychedelic stuff uh, with uh, members of Yes and um, Asia and a lot of prog rock names. You know, Jethro Tull, even. Um, uh, Bumblefoot, you know, the Guns N' Roses guitarist because he's in Asia now, you know, there's a track with him and so I was mixing his lead guitars Damn. which were amazing. Steve Hillage who I've been a big fan of, mixing his solos on tracks and so yeah, I kind of ended up being a studio cat for a couple of years which was new to me because I'm used to being on the road uh, but uh, this year uh, looks like I'm going back out with the uh, Wonder Stuff who are a British alternative rock band pretty popular over there for many years. I did a tour with them last year and two years just prior to the pandemic in 2019 before I uh, did a new album with those guys. So yeah, I'm going to be out touring with those guys in June, which would be nice. And again, I think we're looking at Australia. That's in the UK. And then Australia, New Zealand, and I think Japan in, um, I think, November, December time. Yeah, nice. Uh, just waiting on the dates for that. So that would be something that would be cool. So I do miss playing live you know that's where i'm really in my element and then peter murphy as well uh now that bauhaus have uh finished doing their thing uh peter was talking about us going out uh later this year because he has a new album that he did with youth um the killing joke bassist who produced his last record uh they've got a new album that we've been sitting on and we want to go out and promote that so that will probably be happening uh, later this year as well 
Nice. So you said you've been a studio cat for a couple of years now. So sort of, yeah. how, how do you, you know, let's talk about the comparison of lifestyles because, you know, I'm, I've been a studio cat, you know, for most of my career. I've, I, I haven't done like a, a full tour. I've done some like one-off stuff. Mm. I've done like s- short things, but I haven't done like a really long tour ever. So I have no experience with that lifestyle. Um, so right. after two years of being in the studio, are you just like aching to get back out on the road or, or have you, have you realized maybe you're, you're liking the, the studio life a little more or equally? I do, I do like the studio life a little more. My, my prior experience of studio work was mixing my own demos mm-hmm. and then mixing some of the projects that I might have been involved with, say Primitive Race, which was like an industrial project I was involved with a few years ago with some of the guys from Prong and Raymond from Pig and um, Krabby from Pop Will Eat Itself. Uh uh, Josh Brad Bradfield from Revolting Cox. All these guys were involved in this project, but I kind of ended up mixing most of the record, and that was around 2015, I think. And um, I found in recent years, I just was kind of doing more and more. I guess I was just learning more and more about the studio process, but I'm not formally trained. Doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> so a lot of it's obviously just yeah. trusting your ears and learning from your mistakes and. Yeah watching a few YouTube videos when you're like, how do I get that great kick drum sound? Yeah, you sort of yeah. get a bit of help. You can go one. down rabbit holes with that. Yeah. I mean, I, I went to music school, but after that experience and from working in the real world, like, it doesn't matter. It's all about how you produce and how mm. you hear and how, what I, you know, it doesn't matter. It, whatever, like, if the client loves what's coming out of the speakers from your work, yeah, nobody cares like how experienced you are or if you went to school or any of that so you yeah. know being self-taught i think is is great especially in this day and age because yeah you like you said you can learn everything you need to know on youtube so mm. it's i think people can learn much faster these days how to get their music sounding how they want it so. went, i mean i just i guess if because i'm not formally trained i didn't go to a music school and anything like that i it took me a little while to learn, you know, you can't use all the frequencies up with your guitar, you know. Yeah, but and as you, guitar players, we're like, we, we want, want the guitars louder. and Yeah, louder, <laughs> and you want all that low end on the guitar. Yeah. So it, yeah, when it's on its own, it sounds like a wall of guitar. But then you realize you've got no room for the other frequencies. Where's the bass guitar going to go? Yep. Where's the keyboards going to go? You know, so I've kind of learned over the years how how to sort of EQ the various instruments and it's a, it's, you know, get my head around it. It's a challenge for, especially for heavy rock and metal, yeah. like that's that's the, one of the biggest challenges is being able to fit the wall of guitars into the mix with everything else. Being, yeah. So you can hear everything and so that the kicks and the snares and the drums, so everything is in your face but not fighting each other. It's it's challenging. Mm. And um, yeah, I think, you know, I've been, I've been producing and mixing for 15 years you know over 15 years now and it's still like you get better and better every year but it's it's a constant learning experience and a constant challenge Mm. and i think that's mainly why i love it so much because it's never boring you're constantly pushing yourself you're constantly trying new things and you know i do yeah yeah i do enjoy it it's so fun man um yeah Yeah. like i i checked out all of your discography and um noticed that you've been doing a lot of mixing work so that's great yeah like i said the pandemic kind of forced me down that rabbit hole and uh maybe that was a good thing you know and it was actually nice to be you know home for a few years and not be on the road so much you know i was in a new relationship with uh my partner Ashley Bad and uh you know we got a couple of kittens pandemic kittens yes Toki and Tulip and uh and also it gave me a chance to work on some of Ashley's music as well you know she was a a composer herself she had all these demos that she'd been tinkering around with with like pro- cr- programming interfaces like machine you know little synth lines and beats and she'd never sung on any of it so having all this time in our hands meant, I was like yeah let's let's do this as a project and so I ended up producing uh, with her her own materials I've been busy doing that and so yeah I think the pandemic uh, was probably a quite a positive for me because we didn't get sick you know, we stayed home and we we remained fairly insular and we had our cats that we were nurturing from kittens and I was getting all this production work in the studio so uh yeah it was quite a quite a good experience for us actually the pandemic you know um 
compared to say some people, certainly the people that got sick, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to touch on, I think the, the first introduction I had to MGT was the ABBA cover. So yeah. I want to like touch on that a little bit and then also, you know, just kind of go down the MGT rabbit hole a little bit. So, I mean, ABBA was, you know, I'm 30, I'm going to be 37 later this month, but ABBA was like before my time. I still love, I love that stuff, but I, I hadn't heard the original. I had, I heard your, I heard your song. Oh, and right. I, then I went back and That's listened to the original. So how does like, it, how is that? Cause it's, it's impossible for me to imagine what it sounds like to hear mine first. And then that one, I grew, I grew up with the, the 1977 version of it, you know? Like, yeah. So like, what was your perception of the original? Well, the original sounded like very like haunting and like kind of bittersweet haunts, like very unsettling to me. Cause like from hearing your version, which is super dark and melancholic and like driving and heavy. Um, and then listening back to it, like the original adds more stripped down and poppier. Um, yeah. I don't know. It just, it had a very, it was creepy to me cause it, it was just a little bit, I don't know how to explain it. It was kind of haunting because it was like, yeah. whoa, hearing it so sparse like that. Um, but no, I, I love I love the original too. But like the way you guys did it together, I think was amazing. Like what you did with the guitar work, what you did with um, the synths, mm -hmm. and having Tim mix it, like it just sounds killer. And the guitar, the guitar leads too. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, I'd always heard that song um, in a much darker, you know, more intense and sort of dare I say gothic tinged way. For a few years in my head, I kind of was like, yeah, I can really hear that song done in a much darker, almost Mission-esque style. And the, the Mission was a band that I played for for many years. And so when um, I had a gap in touring, um, I wasn't touring with Peter Murphy. We'd kind of fallen out. Um, this was around 2014, 2015. I was sitting on all these demos uh, that I'd amassed over the years. Yeah, because I would write, write demos sometimes for people like Peter Murphy, who I was working with, or The Mission, people like that. Um, but they wouldn't use a lot of them. So I, I sort of was amassing more and more demos. And I was also just demoing stuff for myself that you, know, just, you just want to get it out and do these little riffs. And you never know when you might, yeah, they might come in handy one day. And uh, I just came up with this idea when I was doing the Primitive Race material, which had loads of different singers. And I was being asked to kind of put together these high quality demos which just ended up being pretty much the released versions because I was working in Logic Studio you know so the quality is pretty good I realized okay yeah I can mix all these vocals in and I was learning production techniques and I was like wow I could actually I'd always fancied the idea of maybe putting out a record that had my name on it and um but I didn't want to I, I just thought all oh, right guitar player album you know Steve Vai and um what are the other guitarists? That, uh, Joe Satriani. Joe Satriani. <laughs> Amazing players. You know, hats off to them. They're really good. But I was like, I I'm not going to do an album like that. You know, like instrumental type yeah. albums, which really show off their playing. Or even John Five, who's a fantastic guitar player. I was like, no, I want. I want, I, I don't want to put out a record. Like that. I'm not a singer. And I suddenly realised, oh, I'll just get my friends, people that I've worked with, or people that I know, to sing on the record. I'll just give them my demos, just like I've been doing this primitive race project. And I'll just put it out as you know, like a a Mark Gemini weight record, uh, but it'd be featuring this singer and featuring that singer. And it kind of took the pressure off me a bit. I'll just write the music and I'll record, you know, the music, uh, compose most of it. We did a couple of covers. Uh, one was the ABBA cover. And so I started putting it together. And um, I, I remember, you know, obviously I had to make decisions on, okay, uh, well, what singers do I know? And I'm going through my phone and... You know, I reached out to obvious ones like Wayne Hussey, the singer of The Mission, and Gary Newman, who I'd toured with a couple of years before, uh, Raymond from Pig, who was actually a referral through doing the Primitive Race projects, Julianne Reagan, who was a singer of a band called All About Eve. I'd known her for a few years. I'd played some gigs with her. Saffron from Republica. I uh, had that big hit ready to go in the 90s. So I wanted her to sing on something. And... Um, Andy Setscan, Setscan Children. So I, I, all these people are interested. I have to make decisions about, oh, so that demo might suit his vocal and that demo might suit his vocal. I'd think about, you know, what would Saffron from Republica like and what would Wayne Hussey from The Mission like? And so I, 
when it came to the the ABBA cover, I had two people in mind one, uh, uh, that I knew. One was Wayne with the mission, and one was Vilo. And I sent it to Vilo, and uh, not expecting him to have the time or inclination to to work on it. And uh, he immediately responded saying, oh, yeah, this is great. Yeah, leave it with me. And the demo that I'd put together pretty much sound, sounded like the, the album version just without a vocal. It didn't change that much except for Vila suggested getting Tim Palmer to give it a posh mix. Mm -hmm. So Tim sort of polished off the edges and just made it really more dynamic, changed the snare sound, stuff yeah. like that, and just made it a great, a more pumping, happening mix. But, yeah, the, the core of it was definitely there from day one. And yeah, Vile uh, did a fantastic job. He recorded his vocals in his home studio in Helsinki, sent them back, and uh, off we were going. And I was just going to put this stuff out as a, a self-release, as you can do nowadays, just you know, go through DistroKid or yeah. something like that and put yeah. something out, you know, very low key. And Vile was like, no, 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 you know, we should do a video for the, for this song. You know, I'll be in it, and let me hook you up with like him's press press agent Silky, and maybe she can help you get a record deal and you know publishing deal. And so he really opened some doors for me, and um, and I think a lot of it was on the strength of how good this ABBA cover was sounding, and then the yeah. other stuff was sounding strong with it. You know. Yeah, I'm so um, glad you did a video for it too, because the video yeah. was killer as well. Yeah, a, a fantastic video from. Uh, Vile Yuli Kakalia, uh, who uh, again Vile suggested we get to do it, or maybe Silky did, one of those two folks. Um, and it was Vile who suggested, oh yeah, rather than putting it out as Mark Gemini Thwaite, Gemini is my real name, that's what I was christened. Um, oh, really? <clears throat> yeah. He said, why don't you put it out as MGT? You know, all the fans, the mission fans just call you MGT, you know. And I was like, yeah, I guess you're right. And he was like, yeah, the German DJs, because I signed to a German label called SBV, so the German DJs will have an easier time with MGT as, you know, as the artist name. So I was like, fine, that's what I'll do. So, yeah, that's why it became MGT. I love it. And yeah. uh, I stuck with it, you know. So yeah. when you were, when you, okay, when you were done with the music for Knowing Me, Knowing You, yeah, did, did Villes, like, did his voice pop up first? Like, you're like, okay, this is... I hear his like baritone vocals like perfectly for this, but you yeah, say, yeah, like, yeah. It's like 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 I said after listening to the your track and then going back to the listening to the original for the first time. I don't know. I probably wouldn't have if I only had heard the original. I don't know. It would have been harder for me to envision like Ville singing it. But the way that you produce the music made it like. I think it just it just opened the doors for someone like him to to put yeah. you know to to be the vocalist on that track. So yeah, that's a that's a great call. I mean, I did, did, I did he? Sorry, did, sorry, sorry. Did he? Uh, when you guys are doing the video together, did he? Were you guys collaborating on on ideas, or he did he just wanted to shoot at home and like just kind of have his own set, and then you do your own thing and compile? Yeah, we kind yeah. of uh, combine. We combine. We did our own thing. We wanted to evoke. Uh, if I don't know if you've ever seen the the ABBA video for Know Me, Knowing yeah. You, but it was shot in winter time and it looked like they'd just gone out. You know, yeah. probably in Sweden where they're from, in the snows everywhere, and they're just hanging out and they're cold, and um, and then this sort of <clears throat> iconic shots of you know the singers singing from the side, you know, with the camera on them, and then straight ahead and. We kind of echoed all of that stuff in in our version, and I shot my footage in like the snowy mountains uh, of me doing the big slash on a mountain top kind yeah. of style guitar stuff. And Vile did his stuff, you know, in a studio, a uh, very atmospheric. And uh, but yeah, the idea was to definitely evoke some of the elements of the original video, but obviously reflect the darkness of our version which I made the deliberate decision to slow down the BPM. I think I slowed it down around 5 or 6 BPM. I, w I tried to see how slow I could go with it because I wanted it to be more menacing and more <clears throat> typo-negative-esque or something. Yeah, you know? exactly. Um, and just, you know, just made it sound as big as possible. There's definite inf mission influences to the way I approach the guitars. You know, I've played with the mission for on and off for like 15 years, did four albums with those guys. So I, I was bringing my kind of guitar technique of the mission to the to the table. So what's interesting is I've just realized I was working with several female vocalists on that album 
And yet it, I didn't ever once think, oh, let's have a girl sing this song. Because I'd made the music so dark and heavy, and yeah. the, the original is girl singers. Yeah. But I was like, no, 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 I, I want to, I want somebody like Vile or somebody like Vile or Wayne Hussey to like, you know, bring gravitas to it. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I love it. It came out awesome, and I, I also really loved the video and the song you did with Ashton. Mm. Um, just yeah, and, um, the reaping. Yeah, that that was the other thing that <clears throat> really took off. Um, was at the same time as doing the stuff with VLA and the other guys, uh, Ashton Knight, this South African singer of The Awakening, had been um, referred to me uh, through a record company guy I knew in South Africa when he read about me doing this collaborative solo record. He was like, oh, you should use Ashton Knight. And so uh, I was put in touch with Ashton. I sent Ashton some of my demos, which included the music for the reaping pretty much sounded very similar to how you hear the final version just without a vocal on it and also um a couple of the other tracks uh jasmine the demo for that and the one called tear the sun and he he sent back these like fantastic vocals you know i hadn't heard of him or the awakening but his vocals were amazing so i was like yeah he's definitely got to be on the record and we just kept writing and that's what led to the second mgt album being a collaboration with ashton singing throughout you know co-writing yeah. it with me love that one um, i really liked um all the broken things yeah yeah we got love john fryer to mix that one nice. and um yeah love that track john had worked with nine inch nails and love and rockets and white zombie and all these great bands um so yeah i was really keen to work with him and i wanted john to mix the whole record but uh, he was busy and the label was saying hey you know we like we were like Mark's mixes. They liked the way I'd mixed it. And I think it's like that Jimmy Page thing where, <clears throat> you know, Jimmy Page mixed all the, and produced all the Led Zeppelin stuff because it's like his baby. He kind yeah. of knows how he wants it to sound. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I would have preferred somebody, I would have preferred John to mix the whole record because I can hear the difference between his mix of Broken Things and my mix of Broken Things. Yeah, I can oh, hear sure. the nuance in the, the way the guitars are EQ'd and, the way nothing's clashing with each other, you know, I can tell when somebody knows what they're doing in the mix. Well, know? yeah, I think that too. And, you know, when you're, when you're producing and mixing your own music, like sometimes it's hard to step away from it because you're yeah. too, you're too precious about it. So I think that's another benefit of having an outside, outside mixer yeah. handle that because they're, they're looking at it objectively and they're not precious about it. So they're just doing their thing and adding their taste to it. But since it's uh, more fresh for them, they're just yeah. acting on their instinct and, and, you know, doing maybe the first or second pass then sending it off to, to the artist. But yeah, like I struggle with that too. Cause I, I've, I mix a lot of my own productions and I, I tend to find myself once you do like the first or second mix, anything after that, you're just making it worse because you're yeah. overthinking it and yeah. you're just tweaking it because you can. And yeah, yeah I think it, it, there's a lot to say about, you know, having an outside mixer handle your own music so especially with yeah. the guitars i'm a guitarist and yeah you you must have had to work on the occasional recording or two where you've got a million guitars to deal with you oh know? yeah and i'm i'm the worst i'm the biggest offender i just will layer loads and loads of the same riff but with slightly different textured guitars maybe mm -hmm. a single core guitar or, you know one guitar's di'd through this and the other guitar's mic through a tube amp and and then you know various counter lead parts and i'm always a bit over the top with my guitar parts and um well if i'm mixing it it's like my children and i find it really hard to be like drop that part and drop right. this and simplify simplify um and of course the big the best rule of thumb is can you play this live and, and if you can't hone it down to where you could play most of it live you know yep. because that that simplifies it and makes it just a better production i've learned this over time you know and i prefer another guy let's say john fryer or tim palmer or uh, david bottrell who i've also worked with um they just would instantly just distill and go yeah th there's too much going on here and they'd break it down they'd all moan about how many guitar parts right. are going just on. mute all of them and then leave and the best to like yeah. left and right guitars and yeah. i respect them you know i respect i can't argue with a guy david bottrell who's produced like you know top 10 tool albums and you know tim palmer who's done ozzy and mm -hmm. pearl jam 10 i yep. can't argue with those guys that no no you got to keep those 15 guitar parts in. yeah you know? so i trust their judgment of course yeah yeah so what else um so are you are you planning on working on more 
MGT stuff this year? Or are you planning on putting out any singles or videos or another album? What's what's going on with that? Yeah, I mean, uh, the last 12 months, I kind of was preoccupied with working on, you know, I did this, I got asked to mix this prog collective album with the members of Yes and, and Asia and uh, Jeff Rotel and all those bands. So I was busy doing that for a while. I mixed um, an album by a Scottish gothic rock band called The Dead Seasons. Uh, and they were like, we want to sound like classic mission. So I was like, I know how to do that. You mm -hmm. know? Even though I didn't mix any of that stuff originally. Um, well, so you, that was fun. Do you find yourself, do you get a lot of inquiries from people that they really love the projects you've been in asking yeah. you to like, yeah. hey, can you give me that kind of sound? Does that happen a lot? Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Dead Seasons being one example. Um, it was Cleopatra Records who asked me to mix the Prog Collective album. And that's because they'd heard my work with Big Paul Ferguson and MGT and mm -hmm. Yerky 69 and you know, mixed some stuff for him last year and um yeah so they they definitely they they want somebody that understands you know the aesthetic of you know dark wave and gothic rock and guitar yeah. rock you know I'm usually going to get like a guitar band's going to want me to sort of mix and produce them you know yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah I was kind of busy doing that stuff and then busy doing Ashley Bad's uh, debut solo material and that was received very well and so we've continued to work on that and i've continued to work on um big full big paul ferguson's stuff uh we're about to start writing for his next record uh, i've had peter murphy also reach out to me and we've been uh, exchanging you know i've been sending him some demos for stuff that he wants to work on for his next record uh, the Wonder stuff are also making sort of baby steps towards maybe demoing ideas for a new album. So I've been sending stuff to Miles Hunt, the, the singer of The Wonder stuff. Yeah, so um, MGT's kind of taken a bit of a, you know, a, a sidestep. MGT to me, when I refer to MGT, I'm just talking about as a as a solo project, yeah. you know. I only ever intended to do one record. I just wanted to have that one record that was when I died and people want to know more about me and look at my discography besides The Mission and Peter Murphy and Gary Newman and Tricky, all these bands that I've recorded with and been on albums with. I wanted to just at least have one that was like my name on it. Yeah, got to, you know, to you know. add to the legacy, right? Yeah, and then with Ashton, you know, we kept writing together, Ashton Knight and... You know, we shopped those demos around, and we actually were going to call the band Gemini Night. I didn't see it as an MGT record because it was like a co-write between the two of us for the whole record. And then uh, Cleopatra offered us a deal, but they were like, "Oh, but yeah, we feel like this should be an MGT record. You've done all this work building MGT as a brand, and you got the big, you know, the 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 him. Uh, sorry, the the Vile Valo single I'd done had got over four million views on." Uh, YouTube and over a million plays on Spotify. They were like, "You're crazy to just drop all that and call it some new band name." So you know, we'll gotcha. we'll put it out. Yeah. It's MGT. So that's what it ended up being. Okay, artist MGT album name Gemini Night. We kind of flipped it around, but so even that really, although it's kind of treated like a solo record because I did write the ma the majority of the music on it, bar one or two songs. Um, I kind of. In my mind, I was like, yeah, I've done the MGT thing. I can just move on and do other things now. But I was collaborating last year with Chris Connolly, the singer from um, Revolting Cox nice. and Big Face. We've done, I think, four or five songs now. And um, that was kind of like maybe I'd put it out as an MGT thing. But I kind of was reverting back to... I liked the whole multi-collaboration thing of the first album, having different people rather than maybe just doing a whole record with one person. Yeah, I kind of liked all the different flavors. So I think if I do do another MGT record, I'll probably revert back to my original template of a bunch of my recordings, but with various friends on vocals. Yeah. So it's, it's it's ongoing, you know. Do you have any thoughts? Um of who you might want to bring in in the future anyone you could you have thought about <clears throat> well i was thinking like robert plant would be nice and uh i'm joking <laughs> jimmy page can't get him so i'm sure i can't um jimmy page is so desperate to get him back for those led zeppelin shows you know uh yeah who else would i want to work with um yeah i've got to think about that really um because i'm 
it's like weird for me to separate MGT from um, other stuff I do like with Big Paul Ferguson you know Paul was coming up with the vocals which I'm used to with MGT and coming up with the beats but then I'd come up with like riffs and chord changes and sometimes and you know yeah. I think would be great too I don't know do you, you like um, obviously I mean if you're familiar with a lot of the 69 eyes like yeah. the discography I think yeah I think Yerky would sound killer on one of your tracks. Yeah, yeah, Yerky's definitely low, uh, low definitely. baritone voice too. Yeah, yeah, Yerky's somebody that I've hung out with a few times, and uh, yeah, we've we've definitely mentioned about the possibility of working together. So yeah, that could po may well possibly happen down the line. Yeah, I probably have to start bombarding him with some of my demos. That's what I usually do is I'll come up with a demo and think, oh, this would be something that would be good for Yerky from Six and Nine Eyes, and I'll send it to him. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I just saw him last Sunday. Um, we were working with uh, Vicente. I know you've worked with him. Yeah, um, on one of his new music videos. Cool. Like, he's just he's such a sweetheart, and like I'm, totally. I'm such a fan of, big fan of Sixty Nine Eyes as well. So it was just cool to, you know, he's just really down to earth and super sweet. And yeah, I just his vocals are killer. I mean, we actually toured together because when I went out on tour with Ashton to do like an MGT tour to promote Gemini Night, you know, we were bundled with Yerky on his his, uh, solo, his solo record. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, we actually toured together in 2018. Nice. So, yeah, that was cool. So what else? New Ashley Bad material. The, 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 album, the album is out already? The uh, no, we've released um, three singles through, singles, yeah. through Cleopatra. Um, <clears throat> sounds like a bit of nepotism, but what actually happened with Cleopatra's interest in Ashley was, you know, I'd been demoing some stuff with her, and uh, one of the songs, The Gun, uh, I had, we had two different versions, where one I had the sort of more half-timey beats, and it was more of a Susie and the Banshees kind of approach to the grooves, and then there was another version where I just kind of did a straight-ahead sort of 120 BPM dance floor beat, and I had sent them to my friend uh, Matt uh, at Cleopatra in the A&R to say, hey, yeah, so you're an A&R guy, which one do you think would make more sense to put out as a single? And he was like, wow, this is like really good. I wasn't like shopping it to him, I just wanted his opinion. And we were planning to self-release, and uh, he was like, oh, this is like really good, I think I think we'd want to put this out, it's fantastic. Nice. You know? And yeah. he said, oh, I like the Seizing the Banshees type version, which was the the version we ended up putting out. Um, that was the video, right? Uh, was, those videos yeah, for yeah. all three, yeah. yeah. So, But that ended up becoming the second single because then we played them Deadly, which we'd already released as a self-release through through DistroKid. And they were like, oh, this is great. Uh, you should pull that off and we'll just re-release it. You know, that's really good. Just get a video together for it. Nice. And so that's what we did. We got a video and very quickly, and uh, they re-released re it. And um, so Deadly became the first single, did really well, uh, was very well received. They even placed it on one of like their movie soundtrack albums. I forget the name of it. And um, then we followed up with The Gun, which was a bit more of a sophisticated. Deadly was a bit more of a sexy thing. Uh, like you know, it was like a, a fun sort of gothic Sisters of Mercy esque kind of dance floor vibe, mm -hmm. and then the gun, and then uh, last August we released a cover of Erotica, which this one was kind of a Ashley Bad, you know, with MGT because I had quite a large hand in, you know, the creation of the music on that version, and uh, yeah, we, and released a promo video for that. So yeah, Ashley's still working on. <clears throat> more material and uh yeah when we've got enough together we'll we'll probably put it out as a record you know nice that Just was my, my next question steps, was to ask yeah. you if you had so you have the three songs and you're currently working on the full album yeah, yeah. we've got we've got a bunch of other songs that are in cool. developments that we're still sort of tweaking yeah nice yeah so so what else do you want to plug for 2023 um let's see yeah before we wrap it up any um any out things you want to plug? Like you have your website, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, if you want to find out what I'm up to, you can go to my website, uh, Um 
bit of a mouthful. I should probably copyright MGT.com, but I'm sure that's taken. Yeah, it, it probably is. <laughs> actually, I wonder, what, I wonder um, what that website is. <laughs> I always forget, but I actually do have MGT Official, and that's perhaps oh. easy to remember. So MGTOfficial.com will redirect you to my, my, my website. I've got both both host names. Um, yeah, so just more studio work and then building up to some live work in the summer with the wonder stuff for sure and, and uh, I think Peter Murphy's looking like you know that he'll be doing something to promote his new record as well nice so are you gonna, you're going to put all your tour dates up on your site when you yeah, have that definitely put the tour dates on the site and there'll be links there for you know the social media sites you know Instagram uh, Twitter and Facebook and all that sort of thing awesome yeah. Mike. well it's been great having you like thank you so much for coming by and uh and the conversation, yeah, like I said, I've been a fan of your stuff for a, a while, and um, it's great to to chat with you. Yeah, so thank you, you so too, much. Man. Yeah, all right. Cheers.